Hey, you've been mentioning a lot about wanting to do a movie night in your theater, and I think tonight's the perfect night for it. I even brought over a movie. I got it for my grandmother for Christmas, uh, but we can watch it tonight. Oh, Wolf so, of Wall Street. Yeah, yeah. That uh, movie has the F-bomb more than on, any other here. movie. Hold on. I wasn't expecting anyone. Hey, buddy, how you doing? Listen, sorry to bother you, but my car ran out of gas right in front of your house. There's a gas station about a mile and a half away. Could you give me a quick ride there? Holy <laughs> crap! Okay. It's the dude from... Wait, are you? What are the... Are you the guy? Are you the wolf? Are you Jordan? I am, I am. Yes, I am. Dude, you were in town. We were just speaking about you. There you go. Okay. Well, yeah, sure. Come like, in. Come on in, buddy. I appreciate come it. Come in. Oh we're gladly... Gosh. Well, I'll go ahead and get this. We'll yeah. yeah, load that up. Now we have to watch the movie. Oh, Let's Brilliant, uh, brilliant. I do have one question. Zach, why are you skipping? <laughs> I'm excited. Zach's... Uh, excited when Zach's there. excited, he skips. Yeah, okay. Here so yeah, let, let's jump in the uh, car. One of the questions I do, I, I, I've been, uh, when I saw that movie, I was like, could this possibly happen to one man? <laughs> is that, is most of it you like? Know, the, the parts that you probably are wondering if they're true, they are true. Some of the stuff's not, but most of the crazy The boat stuff capsizing, the plane true, crashing, the plane, all this, all your aunt true. dying. All with, true, like, all true, all true, yep. And look at uh, Lamborghinis. All right, well, you know, you know the scene with the Lamborghini, right? By the way, you should let me drive, because... Wait a second, I remember, that's the scene no, no, where you... What's the chance of happening twice, right? There's no chance, <laughs> I'm pre-disastered, right, buddy? You're a good salesman. I am, right? Believe me, you won't I might drive won't this first. I might drive the first one, and All then right, from fine, yeah, okay. next time, once we there come... There we go, from, I got an IOU then. Was that, was, that was the I got true a check, thing, right? where... It, it was, was true, but listen, it wasn't a Lamborghini, it was a Mercedes. So was it Quaaludes, or what was, what made him, like, the Well, it was Quaaludes, but it was... The original, real, real quails, like these ultra strong quails, 1978, that were, had a delayed fuse. Long story, but it was a good one. Yeah. Do you remember trying to drive the no, Lamborghini? No, no. I think, or the Mercedes? I, think it, I remember it like it was yesterday, but I also could say that I could pass a lie detector test. I don't remember hitting one car. Like I. So drove. the whole scene where for you, no, you I just went home and then you were like, I, <laughs> I was like, thank God I made it home. Without a, I had no idea to this day I could pass a lie detector. I don't remember what happened. I really don't. You know what? Before we jump in the. Well, we'll jump in the car, but afterwards, I want I, I want to ask you a couple questions. You can come on my my little radio show. Oh yeah, give me guess. <laughs> so in the movie, question for you: How did you help in terms of were you on the set? At, uh, just at the end, because, you know, listen, the, the movie, watching a movie and film is kind of boring, actually. It's very slow. Right. It's like, you know, it's watching paint dry. So, but at the end, I was there, and, uh, but I worked really, really closely with Leo on the script and on the, uh, you know, really the dialogue. Because you wrote the book. Yeah. Well, I, I, yeah, I wrote the book. Terry Winter, a great writer, wrote the script, and I went and kind of rewrote the actual boardroom scenes with uh, all the stock stuff, but Terry was amazing. Great, yeah. great job he did. So now you're where? You're in. Uh, you're here in L.A. Yeah, I'm at the back by the beach, South Bay. Yeah. Nice. You've been all over. I was reading. Oh, you I have you lived in Australia for a while. You lived. Obviously, you're from New York. I just got invited to Iran today for four days. Wow. Do speeches in Iran. Yeah. You gonna take it up? Yeah, absolutely. Why not? Right. I used to say that my movie was a, a hit everywhere, but I ran in North Korea. Now I guess it's just North Korea. I was wrong. Nice. So what? It, it, at this point in your life, is it all excitement? Is it? travel adventure do you like are you back in business i know you've got your sales a lot of consulting consulting but, uh, and you know, programs i'm fortunate that uh you know that make business has been great with speaking consulting and uh but you know you get to a certain point i mean i, I listen the whole party craziness like that is a good memory right <laughs> but you know the things that make sense at 25 don't make as much sense at 55. right uh, but so i look at back at those days you know and, Say, yeah, okay, I did it, you know. But now I got a, you know, I'm married, I got a great woman in my life, so very happy, you know. But I, I, mean, it's, I, I was, I'm always working on something. I always have a project I'm working on. I can't just right. sit still for more than a couple of days. I go nuts, right? This is it. This is good. Yeah, this car is pretty fun. All right, that was a good drive. By the way, guess what is on the bookshelves here? Ah, there you go. This is a new one you wrote. It is, yeah. You've, how many have you written? Three. Three. So at one point, you make $22 million in three hours on this IPO of Steve Madden's shoes. And then you need to open up a Swiss bank account to put all the money in. So you put it in an aunt's name. <laughs> but your aunt didn't know about it, right? Well, she knew she about knew. it. She knew. 
But then you go on this boat and you're, you get word that your aunt died? <laughs> no, no, no. Is that, I got the timeline on? No, that's the movie. I mean, that's that's Oh, the, that's the movie. Okay. Now, all of those things happened, but they not, didn't happen in that order. And uh, the, the, the real Did version... Did the yacht capsize? Yes, the real version is much better. So, now, so in the movie, um, I'm on the yacht and I get news that my aunt died and I have to go back. They have to leave to, right, and end up getting into the storm. That's not what happened. What happened was I had my yacht in Rome for vacation. I was wanting to go to Sardinia, and I was addicted to quaaludes in a big way, right? Cocaine, you name it, right? every drug under the sun, right? And I got into this frame of mind that you sometimes get into when you take ludes, where, short for quaaludes, <laughs> where I call, I, like the, I, call, ludes. I call it the movement phase. Yep. Like there's the, there's the tingle phase when you first take a quaalude, your fingertips tingle, you feel euphoria. Then there's the slur phase where you slur your words and you say, well, okay, I love you, slurring is fine, right? Then you get into the drool phase where you're drooling like, you know, <laughs> but you're okay, drooling's good, Is this kind of the Lamborghini scene in the yeah, thing? And then yeah. phase four is unconsciousness, right? However, there is, Not a, as good. there is a fifth phase, which okay. happens once in a while, called the movement phase. That means you get like the drug-induced equivalent of ants in your pants. You can't sit still. It just so happened that as I was heading <laughs> down the hill to Puerto Chevro Vallarta, where the yacht was, I found myself in the movement phase, and there were white caps in the harbor, and when we got to the boat, the captain says, we can't make the crossing because there's a storm. And I said, I have to cross or I will die. Because I I just I could not <laughs> sit still. And I convinced the captain, unfortunately, using my powers of persuasion. So this is where persuasion did you wrong, right? Correct. And I convinced the captain to take the boat because I said, if I, I said, I said, Captain Mark, if we sit here, I will die in this. So I, I says, all right, we, we'll break some plates. I said, will we make it? He goes, we'll make it, but it's going to be really bad. I said, let's do it. It seemed like a great adventure, right? So I went up to the top deck, took four more ludes, fell asleep, woke up, and I was in 50-foot waves and the rest of the same history. 50 foot waves? Unbelievable. It was just a freak storm kicked up in the Adriatic, and uh, oh, we ended up my. getting rescued by the Italian Navy SEALs, which was amazing. And then what happened was they took us to Sardinia. So wait, a, wait, 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 not to interrupt you, but... Were the quaaludes strong enough that you were sleeping part of the time when there was 50-foot waves? No, 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 no. I was, I, it I was woke take, you up? No, I've been in a big storm in the ocean. That'll wake me no, up. I was an expert at something called balance. Like, I was treating my body like a, a human... I'm sober for 20-something years, right? But back in the day, I was like a Petri dish. I would take ludes to mellow out, cocaine to wake up. So I was balancing between ludes and coke that day. So I was awake for the whole, very proud of that. Probably yeah. not the Buddhist meaning of balance. No, Probably right, exactly. Not quite as much. So I was balancing, <laughs> right? And, um, and, and so I was awake and loving it because I wanted this, I was so happy that the boat was gonna sink because it was so expensive and I was so sick and I was like, this is great. And then like, oh shit, we might die. I'm like, oh, this is not so great. Then but, you remembered you were on it. <laughs> right, like, wait so a then, second. <laughs> anyway, we got rescued, um, and then what happened was, so seven days later, we all had to buy everyone new clothes because all our clothes went down with the ship, right? The only thing we rescued was the quaaludes, thank God, when the boat was going down. <laughs> they should have put I that in my, the movie. No, I sent my friend down for those. They were, in the, they were in the downstairs cabin. I said to my friend, you have the ludes? He goes, no, they're downstairs. I said, Rob, you get the fucking ludes, you know? So Rob go, runs down. <laughs> he comes back, goes, the cabin's flooded. I can't. I said, fucking Kids. Go and put a fucking snorkel on. Go down there, right? <laughs> Sacrifice okay. your life. I right. need my they're, they're in like a, they're in a, a hermetically sealed bag. Go get. He goes, all right, you're right, you're right. He goes down there, nothing. I go downstairs. I, I, he seems standing at the top of the stairs with his pants down, his ankles pissing on the carpet. I'm like, Rob, what are you doing? He goes, I always wanted to do something like this. I'm like, Rob, just go get the ludes, right? He goes downstairs. He comes back up a minute later. I couldn't do it. I got shocked. The water's electrified. Oh. I looked at him. I said, soldier. I said, you fucking, yeah, I don't care how bad, unless it's like. Did he get shocked while he was peeing? Yeah, no, no, while he was down there. Because it'll come right through I said, the you stream. go down there. So he went, he goes, you're right. He goes, like, I'll do it. He goes, but if I die, get my wife a breast job. Just promise me. I said, all right, I'll do it. Get more. If I, my that's wife, what he I'll, said. If I want my wife to get a breast job, pay for the breast job. She's that was done, his, not, so not like the movie where you say, will you take care of my wife, no, Mr. Best Friend? The breast will job, you get her a breast job? Why yes. did he want her to have a breast job? She was bugging him for a breast job. He didn't want to, he was cheap. So he said, if you pay for that, my death will be meaningful, okay? So he goes downstairs, comes back up with a bag of ludes and third degree burns and his hair up in his yeah, right? All right. And then ten days later, here's the irony. So ten days later, uh, we, 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 ten days later, we, we we go to the battleship first, right? And then we take some more loots because it seemed like we should do that, right? And then we went to uh, the Cal de Volpe Hotel, the world's most beautiful and expensive hotel, where you like you take an olive. It's like they have a guy with a microscope, ten dollars on your bill, right? So check that out of there. Ten days later, right? It's like seven hundred thousand dollars later, right? 
And 700 had, grand yeah. was oh, yeah, the, yeah. the hotel bill? Yeah, I had it from 18 people. It was nuts, right? So anyway, I bought everyone brand new clothes. Right now, this is the second time because my wife lost her, her bag. This, uh, the story can go on and on. I want to get to no, the point. No, keep going. The, Don't. Do well, not stop. Right. Here, no, 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 keep going. This is great. Uh, well, so what happens, my wife originally, when we were getting on the plane, they, the driver forgot to put her bag, bags on the plane. So I had to buy her new clothes. So before we got to the yacht, we stopped in Rome went shopping, got our new clothes, and then those boat clothes went down with the boat. So the clothes sank and with the boat. And then we had boat. to get our new clothes in Sardinia, right? And then you went to, it was the hotel, the $700,000 yes, hotel, yes, after yeah. that? Yes, after that. So then we went, we had to buy, buy clothes, but it was only like Johnny Versace. It was, it was like peacocks. We were all purple and pink the whole week, right? <laughs> so finally, the last day of the, of the, of the trip, right? I had this great idea. I said, you know what? If we bring all this shit back through customs, we're going to be hassled. My name was on a watch list already. I'm like, let's just ship it all back to DHL. All we need is a toothbrush and underwear because we're going on a private jet home. Great idea, right? So we all box up our shit. We, we send it off back to the United States. Next one, we wake up. We go to the, hotel, to the airport. No plane. I'm like, what the fuck? No plane. Now, this is back before cell phones, right? Yeah. You know, and no one spoke any English. And after about an hour, I was going crazy because I'm out of loops now. No reason to be away from home anymore without the loops, right? All of a sudden, <laughs> some little Sardinian midget comes scampering up to me. Literally a midget? A midget. Comes up and goes, didn't you guys throw midgets no, in the movie? No, that's, that's exaggerated. We talked okay. about throwing midgets. They threw midgets after I left. I was not involved in that. So don't hold me responsible. <laughs> so anybody who's a midget... Do no, not I, protest. Yeah, yeah, this, this, this episode. yeah, exactly. Don't, don't, please don't. <laughs> hey, but the point is, is that um, he says, Mr. Belfort, I'm like, what? He goes, plane crash. I'm like, what? But my plane crashed 10 days after the yacht sank, okay? And like, it took off at of uh, Orly Airport in France, seagull in the engine, gone. A <laughs> seagull hit your private so now jet? I lost, yeah, yeah, so I lost the, lost the plane. We gotta we got <laughs> say this for a second. A seat, your plane, your, your, plane, plane. your yacht sunk. Then, then your plane, plane got plane, engine plane. got hit by a seagull. Yeah. So then pilots live, thank God. Did right? you ever like wonder if there is re something in the past mm. life that no, might well, have so, happened? So here's the thing. So right. <laughs> well, no, there was. I did make some great anal analyzations that day. So. Uh, after that happened, I mean, we got stuck again with no clothes in, in Italy, and I had to get out of Italy at this point. So we, we took a plane to London, a, a commercial plane. We ended up in the wrong airport, Gatwick. Go to the. To but you had clothes on. You had, uh, the clothes you wore, Versace. Right? They had like purple and everything. But here's the irony, you know? Look, I'm here's how crazy purple, drug. Oh, here's no. how crazy drug addiction is. Is that at that time you'd think I'd say, okay, obviously. God is telling me this. My life's out of control. I'm doing. There's something not right here. Right. I, right. Everything's insane. I'm doing drugs all the time. Things are happening. No. I went even crazy the next day. In other words, <laughs> use I, it as a sign you yes, should be partying to harder. keep going harder, right? It was a year later that I got sober finally. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So that's the uh, what ha that, that's the true story about the yacht. Now, the true tr story of Wolf of Wall Street. You heard it here. And by the way, I heard Chance the rapper said today he wants to hang out with Drake because Drake has an exciting life. Chance, <laughs> you probably wanted to be with Jordan Belfort in the Wolf of Wall Street like you days. You should let me drive the car because who knows what's going to happen, right? No, after I hear <laughs> this story, I'm right glad now. you did not drive the Lamborghini. Right. But All you right. have two, so there's only, you had backups, okay? So I saw yes. that. All right? So that's good. So anyway, <laughs> so, but, but, you know, here's the thing, though. I'm sober now for over 20 years, right? That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. And that was a miracle, by the way. And it was, it was something that changed my life. But when you're in that headspace, you can rationalize anything. Yeah. Like you could just like, I said, oh, it's, you know, no, it's no problem. You know, I'm going to the bathroom, I'm shitting, it's green. You know, my, I'm, my nose is bleeding. It's a disaster. Yeah. But you're saying, oh, it's not, it's my allergies. It's my, <laughs> like you could just, you know, so. Um, in addition to having this amazing life, you also are a master at sales. So people watching, I get a lot of entrepreneurs. Keep in mind that um, pretty much everything's about persuasion. At the end of the day, I mean, you're always selling yourself. But I mean, I think that. There's so many people out there that have great ideas, you know, great concepts in their mind, but if you don't know how to verbalize that or express it to someone else, it's, it gets locked inside of you. You, you, know, you can't express that value, that greatness, and you end up dying with your music on your lips. It's, it's a really frustrating thing to yeah. go through life that way. So. Now, this is something pretty rare. I rarely do interviews with a ton of notes, but I found your book <laughs> and story so interesting that I was like, I got, I'm going to do extra detail. So. You did homework, basically. I did homework. Well, I read the book. I like to. I try to read a book a day, and this was my book of the day. Okay. So, best. You were. You're a best-selling author, as people know. The book. The the movie was adapted from your book. Mm -hmm. Leonardo DiCaprio plays you. It was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Picture. It's an amazing story. 
It also has the most uses of the F word in any movie, 569. Is that right? <laughs> it's either 509 or 560. What's, Over 500 plus. <laughs> was that because you are from New York and people in New York just swear a lot? Combination of New York and Wall Street together is a deadly combination. <laughs> it's like the most common word is the F bomb, except for the word the. So it's, you know, neck and neck. If you would have had a sailor story, that would have been, you could have combined <laughs> Wall Street, New York, and sailors. So for those people, I think almost everybody's seen this movie, but you worked at first for this L.F. Rothschild, mm -hmm. working for a guy, Mark Hanna. And you got into the whole sex, rug, ro uh, sex drugs, and rock and roll world of Wall Street. Um, why'd you leave? Well, you see, the, the movie is a bit is a bit inaccurate in that sense. That when I was at LF Rothschild, I was a trainee, right? Okay. And in the movie, it depicts me, you know, being this sort of bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, ethical guy saying, "Can't we make our clients money too?" The right. First day, and then the next scene, I'm in a strip club snorting coke, right? That's, <laughs> that, that's not quite how that it happened. Sounds like Zach. Yeah, yeah right. That, Where it, are you, Zach? You know that that de evolution of the human spirit took about probably two and a half, three years. So. At the time, I was, you know, a young, idealistic kid. I wanted to make a lot of money. Uh, I was married to my first wife. She was a great lady. Um, but then, my first day as an actual stockbroker was October 19th, 1987. Day oh, of, wow. Yep, the market crash. Black, Black Monday. Black Monday. And I watched in shock and awe as the market went down 509 points in a single day. And Rothschild... Just, were people committing suicide back then? Any brokers yeah, jumping off? Yeah, yeah, one or two jumped out. They probably would have jumped anyway. But the point is... is that, <laughs> they were just in a jumping always a jumper move. here and there around the world, right? But the point is is that um, Wall Street basically shut down for a time. And if you're, you know, you're probably a bit younger than me, I think you're definitely younger than me. It was, it was perceived back then that this would be the beginning of the next Great Depression, that it wouldn't just stop there. It would cascade into the whole economy. And it didn't. So... But imagine back how, that day, how scared, it was just, yeah. the fear was incredible that so, day. So baptism by fire, they Basically, call it. Basically, yeah. So then you go, and you ended up at this firm. Um, it was Oak, what was it? Oak well, Stratton or something? Oak well, well I, still, I went to a firm called the Investor Center, which is a penny stock firm, right? Okay. And that was where I, um, you know, it was really the first time I ever sold stock. And I became the, the top broker the first day. I just broke all the records. Really? In the first day you My broke all the records? Right? First day, yeah, yeah. So you're a born, do you think you're a born salesman? Well, yeah, for sure I am. I'm a, and there are people out there who are, you know, born closers, born salesmen, far and few between. There are some. Um, when that really means, though, what does it mean to be a born salesman? What it means is that you're actually running a strategy automatically yes. inside. You're doing it. You're, you're doing, still following a script, but it comes natural. Automatically. So, but you don't realize it, but you are following a certain protocol that gets you to the same outcome every time. So that's really what a board closer is. So for those people watching that are entrepreneurs, want to learn sales, what did you do in that first day that you basically became a top salesman? Like, was there, we're going to talk more about your whole sales straight line formula, but first day you didn't have time to implement a whole script. What do you do that most people don't do? Is it your tonality? That's one of the things, body language, tonality, mm -hmm. um, taking people through features, not just features, but benefits. Like, what do you right. think you did that first day? Well, in fact, I you see one of the interesting things you said. Like, you didn't have time to put together a script. In fact, I did. Oh, you did. Oh, yeah. On I, day I, one, I took three hours to write one. See, I would never. This is something interesting to happen many years later. This is relevant. Is that when I was tested by some psychologists mm -hmm. about my ability to close, mm -hmm. they put me through a whole battery of these weird tests, and one of them was a mock sale where I had to close someone in an investment type of situation that was being filmed. Was it like, sell me this pen well, no, kind well, of thing? It was a hand to me a, 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 like a, sort of a, a, some information on the dairy industry, and I had to then convince someone to sign, open up an account at a firm to manage the money for the dairy industry, right? Okay. So they handed me about 10, 12 pages of, of, of information, right? And they said, take as much time as you want and, you know, to study this and let's see you close this guy, right? So I start reading it. I'm reading it and I'm reading, right? And I start writing down my thoughts. About 30 minutes later, they knock on the door. I'm like, yeah. I said, do you need more time? I said, yeah, just give me another 30 minutes. I said, okay, no problem. 30 minutes goes by. They come back. I said, just give me another 20 minutes. They said, no problem. Take 20 more minutes. I said, give me 15 more minutes, right? Anyway, after about two hours, I said, I'm ready. And I had wrote myself a really, really, not an exact script, but pretty close to a really killer script with sort of, you know, how I would actually engineer the sale from start You're to finish. You were selling penny stocks. No, no, this is, no, this I'm talking now is recent, many years oh, later. Oh, recent, okay. But I want to tell you this because it's relevant. Now, 
This was a 19, this is like, I think a 2010 if this happened, okay. right? With psychologists being filmed. Oh, okay, this is the and later test. And they called test. in yep. some guy who was an actor, and he was supposed to be the CEO of a dairy company, and I was supposed to close him. So we go through this whole thing, and I introduce myself, and I, we go through this back and forth, back and forth, and they're filming the whole thing. And after about 15 minutes, the guy just, he's like, okay, fine, I'll open up an account. And he starts laughing his ass off. So I'm like, what's so funny? Psychologists come in, they say, we told him under no circumstances should he say yes. Yep. Yet within 15 minutes, he, had no, he said yes. I don't get it. He said, I said, well, you know, when I got the guy into a situation, did it make sense to say no? He said, well, here's the weird thing. We've tested 100 other people in sales, and no one ever spent more than five minutes reading the material. Huh. You spent two so hours. So preparation, it's some simple fundamental. Strategic, well, part of the straight line is about strategic preparation, meaning that you don't, you know what, listen, my overriding concept is every sale's the same. Right? Yes. And that would seem to be counterintuitive yes. because everyone has different needs, different belief systems, right? Different yes. outcomes. You know? But the truth is that every sale is the same. Yes. And I'll explain that a little bit later on in the interview. Um, but it starts with your ability to essentially make an airtight case to someone yes. on both a logical and an and emotional, emotional level, right? Yeah. About, you know, essentially why you're right to want them to do whatever you want them to do. Why does it make sense, right? Yes. And it's gotta be an airtight case, and then you have to be able to also accomplish other things as well. So there's two ways to go about that. One is to wing it, which yes. you could, might be able to do if you're really, really great, or you can write it down, plan it out. I mean, the second one is where you really start to bring your averages up tremendously. So I'm a big believer in strategic preparation. Yeah, so one of the things, I'm gonna skip around, sure. you, you brought this up. One of the things that you brought up, uh, it, you bring up in the book, where did I put the book? For those of you watching, popping in live, this is his new book, Way of the Wolf. Uh, so you, you say basically there's the three tens. People need to be a 10 in three areas. On your product, right. on trusting you, and on trusting the company as a whole. And you talk about how most salespeople don't understand. You gotta bring people to a 10 certainty that it's the best product for right. them, that right. it's the yeah. best company and you're the best person to sell it. Well, again, imagine a continuum of certainty, like a one on this side, yeah. a 10 on this side, right? And 10 means absolute certainty, the best products in sliced bread. A one means they think it's the biggest piece of crap ever, right? Yeah. So obviously you want your prospect to be at a 10 or as close to a 10 as possible when you ask for the order, right? Yeah. So most salesmen, even rookies, will you know, intuitively will know that. They'll say that makes sense, right? But what they don't realize, it's not enough. Yeah. You also have to get them trusting and connecting with you, you with that same person. Yeah. high level of certainty, right? Yep. As close to a 10 as possible, right? Versus a one being they think that you're a thief. So, they, nope. so sometimes they think it's a good product, but they don't like you, so they don't buy. People don't buy who they don't like or trust or yeah. connect with, right? And the third element is the company that stands behind the product. Yes. So those three elements have to line up in every sale, no matter what you're selling, it doesn't matter. Tangible products. You were selling dairy. In, you were selling information, ideas. So concepts, if you were going right? to sell a pen, where's a pen? I meant I meant to bring a fancy pen. Uh, sell me this phone. <laughs> sell me. So, <laughs> so the famous line in the movie at the end, they actually bring you in with DiCaprio. Is like, sell me this pen. Now you, I'm going to get to that later. What, what the interesting answer your business partner right. gave you when you did it. But the idea is, this pen they have to think is a ten. They have to like you as a sales guy, and in this case, they need to think BIC, the company, is a great company. That's your ideal kind of framework. Yeah, yeah, yeah. basically it is, but again, the, the, that this particular exercise is really not about so much the three tens, it's really about what does a salesperson do when you say sell, that, sell this, right? Well, the rookie salesman will say, this is the greatest pen in the world, this pen, they'll start trying to do some version of the three tens, like, yes. this is the best pen in the world, it writes upside down, never runs out of ink, best value, blah, 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 so you know, talking a mile a minute, right? But the fact is, is that the only logical thing you could really say to someone before you sell them a pen is, first of all, are you in the market for a pen? Yes, qualify. What type of pens are you using yeah. the pen? You have to start asking them questions, and this is the yes. big mistake that salespeople make, because A, by gathering intelligence in the beginning, yes. it allows you to identify their needs, their value systems, any pain they might be feeling about you know, a lack of, of not having something, right? And just as important is that it's through asking questions yep. and using certain tonalities, and you mentioned tonality and body language, and just as important or even more important, how you listen to the answers. Yep. Do you listen like a robot without making a sound or moving a muscle? Or when someone answers you, do you say, uh-huh, yup, mm, yup, uh -huh, right. uh -huh. Now that 
such an active listening, this is how we really get into a tight rapport when it comes to sales. Yeah. So by asking these smart questions, and again, strategic preparation, you want to plan that out before, and I want to write down what are the questions I need to ask here, right? Yep. What's the best order to ask them in? Because yep. there's certain rules for that, right? And what tonalities do I want to use when I ask those questions? I could say, so, what's your biggest problem right now? And, you, and I'll be okay, well, what's your biggest problem? And you'll hate me. Right. So there's a tonality. Yeah, you talk like, about that later in the book. You talk about, um, Bill, the charisma comes from a tonality that says, one, I care about you. Two, I understand Report. you. And yeah, three, yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel yeah. your pain. Yeah, exactly. You're yeah. talking about how Bill Clinton was great at yeah. that. People felt like, oh man, this guy gets me. I, I read, tell me what you think of this. I read a story about uh, research on dating. So they put basically hidden cameras on people going on first time Tinder dates or whatever. Scary proposition. Scary proposition. <laughs> but what they found was, as you would kind of expect, um, Guys who ask dumb questions, don't pay attention to the answers, just kind of like, inner, like, so how many kids do you want to have? Like that, it, they fail. And also guys who don't have the right rhythm, right. which you're calling rapport, sure. like who either talk too much or don't talk at all. Well, look at it this way. You know, there are certain commonalities to all human beings, right? When it comes to rapport, getting yep. into rapport, both in a business setting and in a personal setting, but it really boils down to two things. Number one, that you care. Yes. That in business, you're not just there to make a sale to earn a commission. You actually care about the person and you want to get the outcome they're looking for. That's number one. And number two is that I'm just like you. We, and not like everything you like, I like. That's disingenuous bullshit, right? Yeah. Like, you know, you see a fish in the world. Oh my God, you like the fish island. You start bullshitting it up. Yeah. That's like not, Michael Scott in that's, the office. That's ridiculous, like right? That. I'm talking about something very different. I'm talking about that you speak at the same general pace they do. Yep. That when they answer a question, like, aha, uh -huh, yup, mm, got, oh, ooh, the, the yes. interest that you see, yup, I get it, we're on the same page. Yeah. And it's very, it's almost below the surface because here's the thing. Imagine, you know, you just meet a salesman, you're, you're a, a prospect, right? And the salesman looks at you and says, you know, I really care about you. And you'll say, what the bullshit you care? You want to make it, the yeah. word, see, in the beginning, there's no words you can say to say, I care about you. Over time, of course, you give great service, you have a relationship. Yes, you can tell someone I care and I've proved that, but in an initial contact, that's so disingenuous. So yes. how do you get that across through tonality and body language? That's how you do it. Yep. So you know? why do you think, well, what is it about us humans that for the most part, sadly, we only learn through massive pain? Well, this is a, good, this is a, 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 a truism for sure, because I think, you know, when it comes to values, right, value changing, um, I've done a lot of studying of that, you know, various types of psychology, NLP and stuff. And, and one of the things that, that, that they say is that, you know, there's either really one of two ways that someone really changes their values. One of them is through massive work and introspection through years of therapy, right? That's one way. The other way is with massive, a painful event. Yeah. Something that, that, that happens to you and causes you to essentially reorder all the meanings that you've had from past experiences, how you apply meanings, and in that moment, you can make these dramatic shifts. That did happen to me. It, it yeah. happened to me when I went to jail and when I wrote my first book. You know, I had this moment where it just like, it just sort of, you know, I was able to really, really sort of become the person I was before it all happened. Like the kid that my parents had said that to the world, I was a good kid, I was a great student, never got in trouble. Uh, when I went down to Wall Street, I was idealistic. I never, I didn't want. So, do you think it was? The, do you think it was the environment? You're idealistic. You get dropped in Wall Street. There's money flowing around. There's sex, drugs, rock and roll. It's, it's just because I do believe. One of my mentors, Joel Salton, told me that the system trumps. Yeah. Individual self-control. So the problem with that is that makes me a victim, but I don't believe in being a victim. No, not and, a and, victim, because you could have left New York. Well, here's the thing. So uh, there's no doubt that yeah. the environment can be toxic to certain people, right? But to many people, it's not toxic. So right. obviously, I think with myself, at least, there were some things inside of me 
despite my parents being good parents and despite me not getting in trouble before, I had certain insecurities. I think we all enter adulthood with certain insecurities. Right. And, you know, sort of um, not feeling that we're as great as we, like other people might think we are. So here's what happens. When, you know, we see it in Hollywood a lot and in the music industry where you have these young stars, they go like when Britney Spears went bananas for a while. Now she's normal again. Great, yeah. right? So, you know, what happens is that, you know, when you're growing up and you know, when you're in your early 20s and you don't have everything you want, you say, you know what, I don't have everything I want because I'm not successful yet. I, my life isn't the way I think it should be. So I understand that there is still pain and you can justify it. It makes sense. Yeah. But then what happens is when you all of a sudden become filthy rich and famous and successful, you still have all the pains and the yes. insecurities. So it exaggerates and, and, well, what no, was Well, no, but now you're like, oh my God, wait a second. I'm, I have the success, but I'm picturing it the way I want it, but I still don't feel good. And that's when the panic sets in. Huh. Because now you have So no you got all that, but you didn't feel it? Well, what happened was, is when I discovered the straight line system, right, which is really the topic of the interview, is when I, when I cracked the code for teaching people how to close. Yeah. That was the game changer, right? I had stumbled upon a niche in the market, right, which was selling $5 stocks to the richest 1% of Americans. And no one had ever done it before. And that was a really lucrative niche. But what enabled me to build Stratton was I came up with a new way of training people how to close. And that system, the straight line, was so powerful and effective that within days of inventing, it allowed me to take any human being, any old, young, regardless of their race, their age, their creed, their color, their socioeconomic background, their educational status, didn't matter where they came from, could have been Harvard or Hell's Kitchen. I yeah. could take them in a couple of days. Even if they weren't natural salesmen. Absolutely, absolutely not. That was Because you talk about it in the book. You took people the in weeks and made them into the people. The world-class that, closes, yeah. right? And the point, and to bring up that whole idea of a natural salesperson, what I essentially did was I was able to take the strategy that I was using automatically, slow it down, and put it into a step-by-step -step formula yeah. that could be essentially transplanted and certain to anybody else. Just a little bit of work. And to this very day, I still teach it around the world, and it's, it's the, what it does for people, it changes people's lives because there are so many people out there that are brilliant, talented, hardworking, good, success yeah, good they, businesses they want. But yeah. they just don't have that ability to get their point across. And what happens is, look at it this way, every idea has a certain intrinsic value, right? Mm -hmm. But how someone else perceives that value is yes. either multiplied or divided by the person who's explaining it. Yeah. So if I explain the idea, they can think it's a great, if someone who's terrible at selling will think it's a shitty idea. Yeah. So imagine, I said this the minute, all the people out there who are these brilliant, hardworking, smart people, they wanna make money, they wanna, provide for their families, they want to help their parents, their communities, right? Great intentions, and they have great ideas, but they lack this one skill, yeah. and they struggle. Yeah. They, and, and, and to me, it's the craziest thing, because here's the thing, it's learnable, it's a, yes. it's a learnable thing. But it's thing. not, it's one of those things they should have taught us in high school, they should have, should have they, junior high. I always say, if it's important, they forgot to teach it to us. One of the best clips on the internet, you should really play this, yeah. play it later on, right? Is yeah, that, we can is cut that, to uh, this. Warren Buffett was doing a speech with Bill Gates about maybe 10 years ago, and he was asked by a college student, what can we do as students to make ourselves more valuable in the workplace? So you'd think Warren Buffett would say, learn how to pick stocks, learn how to investments, you know, whatever he would say, right? Not what he says. He says, go out and take a course in sales and communication. Yeah, yeah he did Dale Carnegie, changed his life. There you go, and that was yeah. the point. Because he took that, he says, I took Dale Carnegie, changed, without that, you know what he'd be without that course? Yeah. He'd be the richest, money manager in Omaha, Nebraska, yeah. that no one ever heard of. Yeah, and he met his wife that way, but the so, love of so his life. Because without the ability to influence and persuade, yeah. you, can't ex you can't put yourself out there into the world and be known for what you really are. Yeah, and we're gonna put a link, by the way, tylopez.com slash wolf. So if you go there, we're gonna have links to more advanced stuff that, that Jordan does. And uh, so yeah, tylopez.com slash wolf, and that will take you right to this. And of course, well, I recommend you can buy this book. I read it word for words, cover to cover on uh, last night before you came. Excellent. Let me, let me, so let's, let's go into this for a second. So in terms of, there's so much here. Let's check out all these notes. There's a, I, I want to get to the most important things first. We talked about, we got the drugs out of the way, which is the most, we got the drugs, we got the entertaining stuff. We got the, the boat. We got the Not plane crash. The <laughs> I like this thing that you say, like human communication. Mm. 
is 45% tone of voice, 45% body language, and only 10% words. Yeah. And what you said is, you know, people are kind of logical, but very emotional. The tone of voice and the way that you look in terms of body language, that's 90%, that appeals to the emotional side of the brain. And then you need to have good words that are logical. So let's, what's let's, a practical yeah. body? Because people love body language yeah. conversations. Well, let me, yeah, let me, uh, just, let me just back up for one second here. In terms of this idea of 45, 45, 10, right? That's been around for many, yeah. many, many years, many different studies about that. But here's the thing that you need to really understand, it's important, is that I'm not saying that the words don't matter. They only matter 10%. In fact, the words matter 100% when you're speaking. Yes. But the thing is you're communicating often without speaking. Yes. That's the point. So it's not like words don't really matter. The words matter. Because yeah. you know, you say the wrong words, then you're perceived as an asshole, it's done, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so the idea that body language is so powerful, what happens is body language has a way of essentially slipping on through the radar of the conscious mind yes. and going right to the unconscious mind and creating a gut reaction. Yeah. That, you know, something just must be there. It must be good. That person must be an expert. I want to speak to that person. Or it might be bad. Or the opposite. Or I don't Correct. trust. You were talking about keeping your simple one, keeping too close, right. hurts yeah, well, like, sales. You know, well, yes. It, or can hurt sales. Or they could just be cold, <laughs> right? So seriously, because you don't know. So the point is that no, but if you're the person doing the sales, well, I wouldn't be sitting here like this. Yeah, you probably right. wouldn't be right, here. But people very, do that sometimes. Yeah, that's a very aggressive. It's also an aggressive sort of angry pose to be as a sales. And resting bitch face. You yeah. hear that at RBF? I know. Where it's sometimes terrible, terrible pretty thing, women, but, you know, not pretty women. I guess men maybe do it too. It's RBF, resting asshole face. That's what guys have. Is that what it is? Yeah, yeah, resting asshole so face. So wrath and yeah, remove. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so where people sit there and like you see it at a club. I've seen it. And then you go up and talk to the person, terrible and they're affliction. like, right. Terrible affliction, resting bitch face for a girl. Because imagine a girl, right? And she's sitting there, and, and she's sweet as sugar. She like just has great things to tell you. She wants, And you look at her, and she goes, that girl must hate my gut. Look how angry. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very terrible thing. So by the way, here's the thing. Um, that can be controlled. Right? Yes. In all seriousness, you know, we make a joke about it. But whether it's resting asshole face or resting bitch face, guy or girl, there's so much more to it than just sort of how you are arrested. It is how you interact when you meet someone, the smile, your eye contact, how much eye contact you make, how close you stand to someone. You right? said in Japan, you should sta stand closer. Well, you said 75%. Yeah, exactly. Should, well, you isn't know, that your rule? 75% uh, well, eye contact. Eye contact. Right. contact. Well, yeah. Because think about it. And by the way, you know, a lot of that stuff is, is not my material, just right. seriously. You know, That's a general well, research. The straight, the straight yeah. line is mine, but the, some of the stuff of body language, that was really well studied by psychologists where they actually did tests with people and they came up with these numbers and these, these things that are just sort of just truths, right? And one of them is that if you stare at someone nonstop, well, they'll, it's like a Mexican stare off, like what is wrong with this person, <laughs> right? And you feel, what, that you say to yourself, what's wrong with this person? Versus if someone doesn't make eye contact with yes. you, right? Now, I remember, my, I'll give you an example, my son, Carter, right? He had a friend going up this kid, I won't mention his name, Lucas, but the point is, no. <laughs> we won't mention Lucas's name. But, well, but, but Lucas was a nice kid, right? But Lucas would never make eye contact. He'd come to me, he's like 10 years old, hi, Mr. I'm like, like, hi, Lucas, I'm like, I want to trick that. I'm like, you ever, he'd look away, and they would never, and I just didn't trust the kid, right? Yeah. Why? Just because of No the, reason. He no could have just been shy. He's a nice kid. I'm sure he's yeah. pretty proud of it. But the point is, this, this ability to come off a way, in a way that someone says, you know what, hit, hit, in sales, let's get to sales. What you really are trying to accomplish is that when the person makes that first instant perception about you, they should be thinking that, number one, you're a person worth listening to. Yep. And why? Because this person can help me achieve my goals. Yes. Now, if you want to get down to what are the three things that really go into that, well, here's what they are. Number one, you need to be received as being sharp, yep. sharp as attack. And then you said to enthusiastic. Enthusiastic, enthusiastic as hell. Now, yeah. I'm not talking about eh, enthusiasm itself. Not that. I'm talking about <laughs> bottled enthusiasm. <laughs> right. It's below the surface. It's a, it could be whispering, but there's a power in your voice and excitement and people just, it must be good, right? And the third element, which is the most important of all, is an expert in right, your field. an expert, yeah. Because we You call been, this the four, there's a chapter on the four seconds. Right, you got now, four seconds to now, convey I, I, that. I said that in 1988, it turned out I was wrong. Okay. okay. I was wrong. Harvard did a study in I think 2013 or 14, and it turned out it was five seconds, so I'm sorry. So uh, that was your guess, four or five. I guess it was five. And here's what else Harvard <laughs> said. 
Here's the crazy part. If you make a bad first impression, it takes you seven subsequent meetings to change someone's impression. Now, I don't know wow. about you, but I never get seven shots. Yeah. If you don't make a good first impression, you're done. So you got to yeah. really focus on that. So those first four or five seconds, you basically got to come off as enthusiastic. You got to come off as an expert. Correct. And you have, what was the first one? Sharp or, attack. Sharp. That's now, right, yeah. Now, look at it this way. So how do you do that? Think about it. Well, is it the words that you say? I mean, the words don't exist. I mean, yes. what, what would you say? Listen, hey, hey, listen, Ty, I'm sharp as a tie. I'm, say, I'm an expert. And you say, what the fuck is wrong with you? You, you can't, yeah. the words don't exist for that, right? Right. There's, so how do you get it across? Through your tonality and yep. your body language. There are certain ways that experts sound, not the words, they sound, they, they dress a certain way, they carry themselves a certain way, and we know that as human beings because we've been conditioned since we're yes. kids to recognize because we were told, Respect your elders. Look, you know, when you went to the doctor, he was an expert. He had a stethoscope. He had diplomas on the wall. He wore a white. We've been conditioned to this. So what? now think about logic. What happens when you're in the presence of an expert? What do you do? You defer. Yeah. You let them control the flow of the conversation. They will ask you questions, yep. and you will give them forthright answers. They're, they've earned the right. So if you're perceived as an expert, it gives you the opportunity, it opens up the possibility for you to control the flow of the conversation. Yeah. And once you've done that, now you can go about making every sale the same because you're making, you're guiding the process. So the only way every sale can be the same is you're perceived as an expert. Yeah. And then you use that perception as an expert, not to talk, 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 but then you start to ask questions, yeah. smart questions using the intelligence gathering tools, right? And then by doing that, you also ask them in a certain tone of voice and with your active listening that gets you into ultra tight rapport. Yes. So by the time you're done asking your questions now, you know everything you need to know. You're in ultra tight rapport. You know where their pain lies, their needs, right? Now you can present your solution. So you yes. have this straight, see, see what I'm saying is this step, step, step. So it all starts to go into this sort of straight line. We do this first, this second, this third, and guess what? This is really easy to learn. Yeah. Once you break it down like you that. You said six weeks it took you? Three weeks? No. To take a beginner and teach them no. the straight line? A couple of days. Three days, okay. They, and then, listen, the, I took these kids who couldn't close a fucking door. Literally. Yeah. They were so bad. I mean, the average IQ was far as gum on three hits of acid. This is not the short, <laughs> deep end. It wasn't the deep end in the gene pool. Yeah. They weren't rich kids. They weren't kids who went to Ivy League schools. There wasn't, I'm the poet among them. These were kids, the lower middle class, kids from New York and Long Island, there were kids that weren't told by their parents they were capable of greatness. Yeah. And any greatness they naturally had in them had been basically beaten out of them, conditioned out of them since they were born. First by their parents, then by their teachers, yeah. by their own friends, by their experiences from not feeling special, not acting special. By the time they entered my boredom at 19 years old, 20, they have been conditioned to survive, yeah. not thrive. Yep. Once you're in that spot, what happens is that you have these beliefs that are supported by it. You, 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 end up, you, you end up, start off as this perfect individual day one. <laughs> you're 20 years old, you're like already crammed down with all these limiting beliefs and stuff. So they came to my boardroom and by teaching them the straight line, it, was, it reordered all their beliefs because I gave them a skill set that changed them who, who they were. Those, it made them more effective. Yeah. So it can't just be, I'm, I'm gonna act effective. No, you have to actually be effective. So the beauty of the straight line system is that it's a skill set. It does change how you can communicate. It makes you a very powerful communicator. It allows you to get the result that you want. So when you start getting the results you want, what happens? It starts to reinforce better. Yeah, you become more confident. Yes, and then that's feeds on where itself. Do you, where does confident fit in? You talk about being sharp and enthusiastic and perceived as an expert. Is confidence kind of part of, would you consider that part of the enthusiasm and the sharp view? No, no, confidence is entirely different thing. So confidence, has there's two phases of confidence, right? It starts off with acting as if. No yep. one starts off confident. Yep. I don't care who you are, okay? The first day when you trust me, you're not gonna be confident, you're not gonna be an expert really, right? But you need to act as if. I would tell my guys, my kids back then, act if you're wealthy man, rich already, yeah. and you'll become rich. Yep. Act as if you have the answers and the answers will come to you. Act as if you have confidence and people will have confidence you. I said, act as if. Now, yeah. do you think people can become delusional the that way? Well, here's the point. Now, yeah. that, that, that can be, and you see it as delusion, 
right. when someone doesn't do the work to become the expert. Right. So that has to be coupled with the fact that I'm actually working and I'm, I'm on the hyper fast track to become an expert, to learn special skills, and then you're actually walking your talk. Yeah. And then it works. So you have to act as if until it becomes the truth, and then you're just acting as you're acting as things really are. But you have yeah. to always act that way. So you think so? Do you so basically? Some people don't do the first part, which is get that initial catalyst, that initial boost to say, you know what? I'm not rich yet, but I'm gonna dress like I'm rich. I'm gonna talk like I'm rich. I'm gonna get up and Tom, work like I'm rich. Question, honest question, yeah. right? You're a, a, an online, you know, personality. Right? You have a huge business, huge following. Let me ask you this. Truthfully, yeah. let's say that I stripped every dollar you had yep. and changed your face. No one knew your name. Yep. And you were to start right now. Could you build it all back up again? I think so. Of course you could. You know yeah. why you could? Because you're still you. You have the skill sets, right. the talent. Okay? So that, that's, when you take away everything from somebody, they're still that same person. Yes. Now, if it's, that's why when a rich person takes a tumble, they'll typically come back. Right? Yeah. Unless they hit the lottery, right? Yeah. Or they were a member of the Lucky Sperm Club, right? Maybe they just inherited it from their parents, right? But for the people that work their way and made their money, they'll earn it back. When you have special skills, right? That is what, you know, and, and you have the vision for the future, you want to take action, right? That's what it takes. It's about special skills. People don't realize how much of success is not an accident. It's like, it's about people that have these extraordinary skills and they take action. Yeah. So I'm a big believer in learning skills. Like you wrote, read my first book, right? Yes. Well, when I first tried to write, I was a terrible writer. I taught myself to write by... Wolf of Wall Street was your first book? Yes. I huh. never wrote before. I couldn't. When I first tried to write, I was a terrible writer. How many uh, copies have sold? A millions of copies, right? Wow. So, so how did I write Wolf of Wall Street myself without a ghostwriter? I picked up a book called Bonfire of the Vanities and started reading it. Tom Wolf, I'm sure you've read it, right? Yeah. And as soon as I started reading it, I'm like, oh my God, this guy's the best writer in the world. I want to write like that. And I used his book like a textbook. I took out my highlighter and I broke down his strategy for writing and I yeah. practiced before I wrote the book. I said, let me first teach myself the skill to write like Tom Wolf. And that's what I did. I spent about six or seven months with 18 hours a day studying. Really? Oh yeah, yes, to the point I could recite the whole book verbatim. Okay, huh. seriously. So, so the point is, is that I learned how to introduce characters. It's almost like it was a mentor. The book was your I mentor. Made, and my model. Yeah. And then I wrapped it up with Hunter S. Thompson because it made sense because of the drug use, right? So I, and I, no, but I used those people. And then when I was reviewing the New York Times, they said the book sounds like Hunter S. Thompson and Tom Wolf. So it was, it was amazing, right? That I accomplished my mission and made, turned myself into a writer. But here's my point. So you basically reverse engineer. You see, I interviewed Kobe Bryant, did a little interview, and he said, you got to go to where great people yes. who have created greatness before and re reverse engineer it. Look at this way. Look at this. I couldn't have done it without that skill. Yeah. If you want to go out there and succeed in the online world, well, you need to have certain knowledge and skills. One of them is going to be the power of persuasion and yes. influence. It's, it's, it's a uniform skill in everything that you do. Whether you're a Bill Gates who convinced IBM to give you the rights to supply before you even own it and convince someone else to sell it, right? Yes. Whether you're a, a Steve Jobs, goes without saying, right? It's this ability to, could be just to sell your vision for the future. Yeah. To sell people, employees to come work for you. To sell venture capitalists on giving you money. To sell your friend's dad to a you know, regular entrepreneur to get someone to invest in you. That's persuasion. Yeah. It's a linchpin skill to success. And that's why Warren Buffett said, if you want to succeed, you better learn how to yeah. persuade and communicate. 80% of billionaires is a good book. Uh, what did, just did research on billionaires and it basically that 80% of billionaires, before they got to their final company, they were learning sales first. They were sales. Ray yeah, Kroc started McDonald's. He was a traveling milkshake salesman. Great movie. You see the movie? Yeah, they do. Well, that's it's a, that's a, great a movie. Keaton, just, Michael Keaton. It just goes, you know, and, then, and the commonalities there was A, great salesperson, vision for the future. Yep. And the ability to move through the setbacks. In other words, to yes. not take no, to not get demoralized when things don't go your way. And, and here's one of the important things about that is that what creates that resilience, so to speak, in people. is an entrepreneurial quality, you need that resilience, right? Well, a lot of it has to do with a fundamental belief that I myself am capable of achieving success. If I believe in myself, yes. I become resilient. I, know, I said, I know I can do it. What happens with most people is they, when they really are, get honest, their heart of hearts, they say, you know, I, I don't really think I got what it takes to be successful. I'm, I don't yeah. really feel like I'm that sort of, I can't see myself being rich. And because of that. Yeah, that is for sure the number. Well, the but, average person watching is like, I get it, but I don't think I can and, do and, it. And What's and your answer and to and them? My answer is that, you know why? 
you know what, study the straight line system, okay, yes. become an expert closer and watch how it changes. Because here's what happens. When all these kids that were, the reason they all became rich, rich, filthy rich, right, was because it sh once you learn how to communicate, the yes. power of persuasion, it changes who you are. It, it, it fundamentally reorders you. So you know what? I did it. Mountains. I'm not the guy who failed before. I'm not the girl who was 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 you know sort of wanted to play a backseat, not put myself out there. I feel comfortable putting myself out there. It just it changes everything. Yeah. And without the skill, what happens? People end up living a smaller life. Yes. And they don't ever get to that level where they're really firing at all cylinders and getting to enjoy the beauty of what life can be. What percentage of potential do you think most people live up to? that aren't trained, that don't build skills, that go through the conventional school system, that have a job that they don't really like, like what? Probably five, three percent, two percent of people live up to their, to their potential. And those, less. The, the other 95, 90, let's say 95 percent, they're here. How much, if you were able to train them and, and they were to be able to get the right mentors, how high do you think this thing could go? 20x, okay, so, 30x, yeah, just, 5x? Just, remember this, you know, so you know, how you define success um, is very different for every person, you know, Mother Teresa was probably one of the most successful people in the world and had no money. So yes. let's talk about success in terms of money. This is a business, segment, yeah. right? We're in business. So in that sense, you know, unless, listen, assuming you have all your intellectual faculties, right? It would be impossible for someone who is really committed to becoming wealthy and was willing to do the work, to learn the skills, it's almost impossible not to succeed. How big is a question? How long it takes? Another question, because some of it's luck. Meaning it might happen in six months or it might take three or four years. When I got out of jail, mm -hmm. everyone was said, oh, you're going to be rich again. And I was like, yes, that's true, but it might take me five years. Yeah. Because I'm not cutting any corners this time. I'm not going to sacrifice my ethics. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it right. I'm going to do it every step by How step. How did that feel? You step out of jail. You had seen it all. You had had yachts. You had had you know, private jets. You didn't even care if your yacht, you had so much money, you didn't care if the yacht went down. How does it feel to, because a lot of us, a lot of people watching, you have to start over. So you I walk start, I, out of jail. What, what's the feeling emotionally? Are you a little scared, con completely confident? What, where are you, what's the state of mind? I, I think that, um, you know, the idea of fear to say that, I'm, you know, when I met my, my, my wife, who's now the, the love of my life and the best thing that ever happened. Seriously, she you know changed my life in so many she's ways. She's here today. She's here also. She's know? awesome. And I'm not just saying that because she's here. It's the truth. And one of the things she said to me when she first met me, she was like, I "Can't believe you. You're like fearless." And I said, "No, I'm scared shit. I'm just not letting it stop me." Hmm. So there's a big difference. So I, I think smart people are scared. So you had some fear. Okay, everyone has fear. Yeah. Okay, that's what courage is all about. Moving past. Without this, without fear, there's no courage. Okay. Yeah. In other words, of course I was scared. Of course I felt terrible. What was your biggest fear? My biggest fear is not being able to provide for my family, so my children, family. and my wife. I love my children, and my wife. I mean, in other words, I want to be able to provide for people I love. That's my big. To not provide for the people I love and not be able to take care of them is the worst thing that could ever happen to me. Yeah. In my life, okay. And everyone's different. See, that's my thing. Yeah. And that, knowing that is powerful. So once you know that. That is part of your why. And once you yes. have your why, you can do a lot of Yeah, that. I always say most people don't know that's what motivates yeah, them. Yeah, that's my why. So and, you were able, so in your darcest time, coming general, out of the darkest time, well, you said, I'm afraid, but I'm more afraid of not taking care of my family. My darkest time was when I was in jail, at night, in my bunk, alone with my thoughts, no money, broke, discredited, embarrassed, lost everything, right? And I close, and the people say, how'd you write, learn how to write, come out of jail? And I said, you know how I did it? When I close my eyes at night, I'd see the faces of my two children. Hmm. And I, I said, I, I have to make it right for them. I have to come back from this. And there was no way I would give up for them. For them, we'll always do more for someone we love unconditionally than we'll do for ourselves. And that's where you draw your power from, and your hmm. self-motivation from the why. Why do I want to succeed? Why do I want to be rich? It's, you know, why people will do insane things for, rel for religion. Because if you believe in something else, God be not yourself. Yeah. You only go so far for yourself, but you run through a wall of fire for your child or your loved one, right? Very big different, big differences. So, so that was what propelled me. And also, um, the fact that, you know, I, I, I was, I got honest with myself. I knew, like, you know, a lot of people would oh, I'm, I was, you know, they conspired against me, I'm innocent. I was fucking guilty. Yeah. I took a great thing. Forget the idea about selling $5 stocks. That was a great idea. That wasn't illegal in and of no, itself. No, it was totally yeah. illegal. 
I took the straight line system, which was the most powerful system for persuasion ever created, and it is by far, nothing even compares to it, right? It really it doesn't. And I took that system and I bastardized it. I taught it to people so they could go out and commit mayhem. Yeah. Now, there's nothing wrong with the system. It's how I applied the system. It's like an M16. Yeah. Is it good or bad? Depends who's holding it. Was it was a pit bull. It was so powerful, right? but it turned the wrong so, way. So I, I said to myself, I'm going to go out there, and I'm going to prove to myself and my family, everyone I love, I'm going to do this the right way, and I'm going to go out there. I didn't know how I would do it. I never thought in a million years that I'd write a book, and the book would become a movie. I mean, who would think that? The chances of that happening are one in 10 billion. I mean, come on, it's like it never happens, right? You know, for every movie that gets made, there's 10,000 that don't, and for every book that gets published, there's a million that don't, right? Yeah. Uh, first time author, so, but it happened. But when it happened, here's the, the most interesting thing of the whole story. So when I sold the book, it was a bidding war between Leo and Brad Pitt. I chose Leo because Leo's Leo, right? And he had Marty Scorsese attached as well. Terry Winter, the screenwriter, famous, amazing, yeah. brilliant screenwriter, he penned the script in 2007. And the first draft was brilliant. Usually, it takes them four or five drafts, right? His was right on the money. Scorsese read it, loved it. Warner Brothers loved it. They went down, struck a deal, 2007, right? Ready to go. I can't, my book's not even out yet. I'm like, they're gonna make a movie. This is gonna be great. I'm gonna be rich again, right? The writer's strike hits. Oh, so wow. They can't finish, right? Leo and Marty go on to do Shutter Island. The wolf gets sidetracked. It takes seven years for it to come back around now. Huh. And that day I was so upset. So what did I do? Did I cry? Did I? Well, no. What I did, I took that time, my wife and I, we met right around then, and we made a decision. It was right when the GFC hit, right? Things yep. were terrible. You couldn't make any money writing. And I said, let's go into the speaking business, build a business together. And we started a business together. We built this big business around the world, speaking and mentoring, coaching, right? Around the straight line. And by the time the movie came back around, I was wealthy. And Leo's like, what the hell happened? You were broke? I, I said, well, here's, he looked at the straight line. Marty saw it and he said, oh my God, we've got to change the movie. The original movie ended with me in jail. They huh. changed the third act to reflect what happened in my life. So I changed my own life story as it was happening wow. through hard work, perseverance, and vision. And that's what I could say to anybody who's watching this. It doesn't matter how, where you are in life. If you're willing to put one foot in front of the other butt, you got to have the skills. Yes. It doesn't happen without the skills. Yes. Whether it was writing a book, whether it, anything you do, there's, a, there's always going to be a certain set of skills you need to be really high level at to get what you want, the outcome you want. One of them is always going to be persuasion. Yeah. So study, listen, study the straight line. It's, it works. It teaches it, anything. Yeah. So for all of you listening, watching, tylopez.com slash wolf is going to take you where you need to go to get the straight line system. Also, as we wrap up, I just want to remind you, Way of the Wolf, Jordan Belfort, it's his third book. I read it. We, we need eight hours to go through this. I'm actually going to put, we're going to record a little special module off, off air here on, uh, for those of you who are in some of my programs too, because I want to talk on this objections thing real fast. Well, the that's, by the way, one of the best aspects of the straight line. Yes, how to overcome, because that's, yeah, you go to sell something and people say, oh, I'll buy it later, or yeah. I don't have enough money, or you know. Well, I mean, let me think about it, let me call you back, bad time of year, it's Groundhog's yeah. Day, it's Christmas, fucking, you know, leap year, you know, right? There's always you know, a reason why. And, and the thing is, is that what, what, what trips up most salespeople is that they don't really understand what objections are. Right. You know, they'll, they'll, people say, this stalls. Okay, fair enough, right? You know, the smoke screens, well, for what? What is it really yeah. a stall? Here's the truth, what objections really are. Objections are smoke screens for uncertainty. Yes. When someone, remember those three tens? Yep. They must love the product. Yep. They must trust and connect with you, and they must trust and connect with the company. Well, guess what? When you ask for the order for the first time, let's say they don't really trust you. Yep. What do they say? Sorry, Ty, I don't trust you. That's very rude. They'll say, right. they'll say, it sounds good, Ty, let me think about it. Yes. See, they don't tell it, it would be nice, it would be a great world if you're processing, listen, Ty, I don't trust you. I'm not yes. I don't distrust you, I'm like in the middle with you. Your product seems good, but I'm not like a seven on the certainty scale, and the company, I'm at a four. So make me more certain. Right, people they aren't even that logical. They're just they going from the gut. They don't realize it. It's all, it's all bubbling below the surface, and they want to be, so, so it's a circuit breaker yes. to say, you know what? It's a let, polite way. Let me just say, let me end this call, and I'll say, it sounds good, Tom. let me think about it. Yeah. Now the salesman, the novice will say, oh, I better be nice now, because this way I can get a call back and hopefully close them later on, when the fact is they're just not certain. So. How do you answer, handle objections? Well, first of all, wait. I want you to hold this because we're going to record a We're going to stop the live camera. 
All of you who want to hear this, go to tylopez.com slash wolf. We're going to have the links to get the straight line system, to get the video little, we're going to do a little module on objections, and it will have a link to Jordan Belfort, Belfort's book. So this public interview, um, I know you got a lot of value. But I want to give the, you guys people special on the straight line system. We'll give them a big discount. Yeah, we'll put, all, yeah. we'll put a discount link on uh, tylopez.com slash wolf. But I'm going to tell you, this is one of the, one of the, my favorite interviews. Me too. This was good.